It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Hello again, this is Brian Handley. I'm founder and managing director of ROI Executive Search, and we do retained executive search across the middle market. Today is the next step in our journey into the corner office, and I'm here to welcome a very near and dear but recent friend, Miss Angela Ball. Angela Ball is the founder and CEO of Hearts for Moms. Hearts for Moms is an amazing organization in South Florida, and her life's work is summed up in these words, replacing fear, trauma, and insecurity with love, grace, and the mercy of God. Brings a uh, you know lump to my throat, Angela. Welcome. Great to have you here. Angela hails from the vibrant land of Columbia, South America, and embarked on a courageous journey to the U.S. at the tender age of 15, all the while and still in high school. Her path led her to North Palm Beach, where she serendipitously crossed paths with her wonderful husband, Ray, with whom she has shared 28 married years, blessed years. And together, they are proud parents to their son, Ashton, passionate basketball enthusiast, diehard Heat fan, and a young soul filled with entrepreneurial zeal who has just launched his new business. Yes, we'll have to get him on the podcast sometime Love soon. Love it. Angela, welcome into the corner office. Thank you, Brent. Thank you for having me. Great I really appreciate you. the opportunity. Love to have you here. And we start these podcasts, you know, with just a little bit of background. We filled mm -hmm. you in, our audience, in a little bit about uh, what you've done and where you've come from. But give us a little more detail. Where did you grow up in Columbia? What did mom and dad do? Tell us a little bit about your early life. Yeah, I would love to. First of all, it's such a great honor to even be invited here, Brand, because um, I've, I've listened to your podcast and just amazing CEOs. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, yes, I grew up in Bogota, Colombia. Um, I have two sisters and my mother, uh, when I came over here to the United States, I actually came over here just for summer vacation. Yeah, 15. At 15 years old. And um, I had a lot of growing up to do mm. at that time. I literally was just playing with my, my sisters and Barbie no, dolls. Were you the oldest of the three? I, or? I'm the oldest, oldest? one. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. the oldest one. So I came here just to help On some your own. family friends. Yeah, I was just going to be here for the summer term and then go back. That was the plan. And uh, the Lord had different plans for sure. <laughs> so um, when I came over, uh, right when I was going to go back, my mom um, actually called me and said, I am going to divorce your father. And while so, you were here. Yes. Yes. Wow. And at that point, Brand, I realized that it was going to be easier for my mom now that she will be a single mom, uh, for her to take care of two wow. of her daughters as opposed to three. So wow. I had to make a quick decision and I asked her if I could just please stay for one year and do my schooling. Yeah. In the meantime, she can figure things out because it was going to be difficult for her. Of course. And uh, that turned out to be after that one year that she was moving to Buenos Aires, Argentina with my sisters. And at that point, I'm like, I just can't do this yeah. again. Starting a brand new place with a whole new culture and trying to figure out life again. Right. So I ended up staying for the remainder of my school years. And lo and behold, this is the plan that the Lord had that I needed to be here for good. So now, did you grow up in a Christian home? Did mom and dad go to church? Were you introduced to Christ as a child? So I, um, I was raised Catholic, okay. and uh, like my pastor says at Christ Fellowship, I was the perfect CEO. 
it was Christmas Easter only. <laughs> so, I grew up Presbyterian. It was pretty much the same thing too. <laughs> so I, I knew of God, but I really didn't have that deep relationship with him. And uh, honestly, that's when, when my life completely turned around was when I really entered into a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And that happened here. It happened here. I was actually um, somewhere around 39 years old. Wow. I was a stay home mom. Yeah. I was uh, my husband and I decided that we were going to raise our son and I was going to be very available to him. I was doing a lot of volunteer work uh, for his school. But when the Lord started bringing me in amazing people yeah. into my life and I really started seeking him, I gave my life to him um, again sometime around 39 years of age. And that everything just turned around. My, my world was just flipped upside down. My priorities became <laughs> God and then my family and then everything else. And I knew that there was just something. There was all of a sudden there was a calling that I knew that was missing in my life mm. and a gap. Um, and I just started getting really thirsty for his word and I, I couldn't have enough. So like the person that actually led me to cry is Belkis. She said, I just wish that everybody that comes to Christ will be like you, that your heart just caught, caught on fire, yeah, Angela. Amazing. And I just thought that was the normal thing, Brand. So my, my heart has been on fire ever since. Well, I want to rewind back a little bit to yeah. that 15 year old girl, mm -hmm. literally such an impressionable age. Now, did you come and stay with family here? Was with it an exchange? With my family. Okay, got yeah. it. And then yeah. did you stay on with them or how did you kind of get through high school without you know, that direct parental support and guidance. Yeah, I did actually Other folks step in. So it, it was, it was such an amazing blessing. Yeah. So when I came here, it was going to be so that I could help them with their house chores and oh. also with a convenience store that still stands ah. there in the North Palm beach area. And actually that's where I met my husband. Got so it, I was, it. I was working at the convenience store, whether it was in the cash register or wow. filling out the cooler, cleaning up, whatever it was. Lived with this family full and time. And I lived with this family for full time. Yeah. Wow. And uh, wow. then, you know, after I graduated high school, that's when I realized that I needed to kind of pivot and, right. and kind of figure things out on my own. Yeah. And so I ended up moving out of their home that's and, right. My then boyfriend, 17, 18, I was about 18, 18. 19 years old right. uh -huh. and I started going to college full time. Okay. And, and that was locally here. That was local. It was, right. yeah, it was a local college. And I, again, I, I needed to work full time and I needed to go to college yeah. full time as well. So uh -huh. I started cleaning houses and that was part of what you, there's a lot of humbling when you do that. But I tell you what, Brent, it was a great experience yeah. and one that I don't take away because I believe that the Lord had a reason for it all. And when you really become humble and, and, and just be willing to do what you need to do, it doesn't matter if you have to scrub the floors or be able to be at amazing meetings, meeting with incredible people. That's what you do. Yeah. So it taught me lots. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. So you were dating your soon to be, or not quite yet, husband yes, yes. Ray at the time, That's boyfriend right. Ray at the time. That's right. And what, did he come from a Christian family? Did he have a so not, spiritual background? So some, again, yeah. he also was the perfect yeah, CEO. -E. <laughs> CEO. <laughs> yeah. So um, I we dated for five years wow. and then we married. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. then after we married, we ended up traveling abroad. So my college education kind of came to a halt. Got it. Uh, we Did you finish up... the degree? Or... No. Okay, so my passion was actually interior design. Right. Um, and and it's incredible because the path that the Lord took me is completely different from what I even started. Right. So then we ended up living abroad in the Philippines for about a year and a half. Wow. What led you there? Uh, my husband's uh, job. His work. So he's yeah. in the golf course industry. Okay. And uh, right. that, that in itself was, a, again, another humbling experience and very difficult because Suddenly I am in a whole different country right. brand and right. I have to kind of like start over again. Yeah. Same thing like I did when I came from Colombia Right. and that builds you up. Yeah. All that yeah. builds you up. Yeah. And then it just opens your eyes to see what's out there. And again, what, what can you do? So, um, we, from the Philippines, we ended up moving to Australia and we live in Melbourne for a good year also following ray in the golf yeah. course development yeah now did you assist with that business were you working no i wasn't yeah. 
um, that was the hard part. Yeah, I, I have right. a really hard time sitting on my hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, what I did start, you do? How, let's start back to the Philippines. Were sure. you in Manila or outside? So I was or? actually just north of Manila yeah. in Marikina. We were yeah. in a typical Filipino neighborhood. Wow. And uh, for those expats out there, they understand the life oh, yeah. of what it is living in a in a different country. But yeah. to taking be... jeepneys around from yes. location to location, <laughs> I know the you Philippines very, well. Very oh, familiar yeah. with that. So it was um, it was it was difficult because he will go to work yeah. and I will stay home. But I had to figure something out. So I ended up um, getting involved with a nonprofit organization ah. that it was actually a little children's home. There were it was an orphanage, wow. and that was the the first time that I truly started diving into you know a nonprofit. non-profit and it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking mm. to hear their stories, how they were abandoned. They literally were were left by by the river or in the garbage cans, and children that that they were just not wanted. Mm. And uh, these are the children that I got to hold. And it, it, again, it built me up to be able to do what I I needed to do. Eventually. You're 20, 21 at the at time. At that time, early um, 20s. I got married at 25, so I so must have 26. been about 27 yeah. ish wow. or so. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. And how long were you involved in that charity? So for a good age? year, yeah. I was there. And right. then after we ended up moving to uh, Melbourne, Got Australia, it. which very again, different country, oh my God, it was back amazing. to the West in many <laughs> ways. <laughs> it was. I mean, it was beautiful country, right. a little too far yeah. for our liking, um, but beautiful people, just yeah. beautiful people. So again, I was just trying to keep busy meeting people, trying to do things. I'm, you know, I'm somewhat artsy in the art world. So I started doing a lot of ceramics, things like that. But it was, again, it was difficult because I couldn't do what I really wanted to do. Were you still thinking about the fashion industry at that point? Was that still something you wanted to pursue or? Interior design. Yeah, interior design. So interior design was, it's always something that has been yeah. my my yeah. thing right. you know anytime that i'm able to go ahead and, and be creative that way right. i love to do that right. um you know i just couldn't do a ton right it was we well, didn't have a work permit that was exactly probably one of the it was problems. somewhat limiting yeah. so yeah. yeah so how long were you in melbourne for a good year good year yeah right. yeah and then what came next so we ended up moving from melbourne to georgia atlanta georgia and another uh, big change yeah yeah uh, <laughs> it was incredible we ended up actually working my husband and i for an incredible company um in the crane industry ah. so it's like completely different so he left the golf so he course. left the golf yeah industry ended up going in there but then soon after about a year and a half that we were there he missed the golf course industry okay. and ended up going back to it. So we moved to San Diego. Oh my gosh, my hometown. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, beautiful. Yeah. A little crazy, a little but up, beautiful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, we were there for a good year and a half, and then finally we we knew that home for us was Florida. Yeah. His this parents, was Ray's home too. It is. Yeah. yeah. His parents moved from New Jersey to Florida, and uh, we knew that we eventually were going to be here right. raising a family. Yeah. So awesome. while I was in San Diego, I actually worked, and that was the first time that I really was exposed to um, marketing. Okay. And so I worked for Cisco Food Services. All right. It taught me a ton of things. Sales, marketing. More so on the marketing, marketing side, side of it. Yeah. yeah. And then creating some of the events and, right. and point of sales, you know, for, yeah. for the team and things like that. So that was a great learning curve. Individual contributor. Well. Did you did you manage a team? Tell us a little At bit. At that time, you. I was really not managing a team. Yeah. Uh, we were a team, but I wasn't in charge of anyone per se. Yeah. Yeah. So we just worked alongside of each other. Did you enjoy it? It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Good it company. Great. It it really. Is. I recruit a lot of people from there. Oh, Sorry, do you Cisco. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, the the beautiful part of it is that. Uh, being that I was in San Diego, well, now we're going to be moving back to Florida. Right. So actually, um, my job. Yeah. boss ended up, you know, opening up an opportunity, an opportunity wow. for me here for Cisco, South Florida. Great. And um, I you remained with, with them. Yeah. 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 And then how many more years did you spend with them? So that was not too long because then again, that, you know, that creative side of me, an opportunity opened up to be with the Northern Palm Beaches Chamber of Commerce. Okay. And I worked for Artigra, the Artigra division, which is an arts, um, as an arts and relations manager at that point. And yeah. that's when I re- really was able to be exposed to managing others nice. and, uh, you know, just being able to work with a lot of different artists and helping them through, you know, when we will have the event and creating yeah. all that part yeah. of it. So, 
that again taught me even more right. on how to do more things that I actually get to implement. That can be humbling world. too. Yes. Particularly when you have people that maybe are more experienced doing the work. And Absolutely. Maybe older than you as well. Did you right. suffer some of that? I mean, was that uh, well, you something know, you encountered? Yeah. And thankfully, I had great leadership. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm thankful that they really took me under their wing and I was able to learn from them. So uh, it was a great experience. Yeah. Now, correct my timing, right? But mm -hmm. I think we're coming to about the time that you might have turned your life over to Jesus. Uh, around the time, yeah, so I had, we had Ashton when okay. I was 33 years old, All right. and when I uh, turned 39, I believe it was either 38 or 39, yeah. the good Lord will let me know when I yeah. get up there, but that's when, when everything radically changed for me, Brent. Were you attending a church? Were you still going to so, Catholic Mass on your no, CEO so, days? Or? Yeah, so I actually started um, church hopping. I was, okay. I was looking for a church, yeah. and I really, because now by this time, I knew, like I, I was knowledgeable about his word right and i i was seeking him i was thirsty mm. for his word and i knew that i i needed more than what again i've been exposed to the catholic church which is great yeah, yeah. uh to the presbyterian church which was where my in-laws went right um, which was great but i just wanted more and uh so the opportunity came to actually attend christ fellowship which is a very large church yep. here in our area we can call it a mega church it I is think. a mega church it is a mega church and <laughs> beautiful it, campus yes and what's incredible about that is that again it's mega but it's not hmm. when you get involved Personal. when you really get into it small you, groups it and... is it's incredible you really get to know people yeah. it's a beautiful environment it's a beautiful culture and you can make it all you want it to be so you found your home so i found my home and uh, i have not left my home uh, since awesome. and that's when my husband actually it was interesting because I knew that I was able to bring our son to church right. um, and then after church you know I'm all in we can do whatever you want afterwards and, yeah but so he started Ashton started attending Sunday school with my, well more or, so with me more with you yeah, of course, yeah. more with As me baby, and then yeah. um, again so grateful that Ray wanted to do the same so yeah. now we are all going as all a family. In. Yes, exactly. All in. I exactly. Love that. So, it's great. so so at that time, were you still working with Cisco or did you kind no, of transition? No, I was long gone. Okay. Long gone. Because once Ashton came around, you were kind of focusing more on being a mother or Correct. was there other work that you did? Correct. What, what was the next step in your in your work journey? Well, and, and it was really interesting because both Ray and I realized that that parenting is just so important. And because we were given the opportunity to, for me to be a stay-at-home mom, Grant, uh, we didn't take that lightly. But again, when I gave my life to Christ, everything changed, and I knew that there was something, something that was missing, something that I needed yeah. to do. There was a gap. Mm. And um, it's funny because I say, you know, starting a nonprofit was not on my bucket list. Yeah, right. I, it was not even on my peripheral view. And did you get involved in any other nonprofits? We're, we're, I want to talk about Hearts for Moms absolutely. in a moment. I mean, sure. obviously, you want to get to that. But prior to that, you'd obviously had the experience in the Philippines. Correct. You probably had some affiliation or maybe knew of some in Australia mm -hmm. and Georgia, perhaps. But was there other nonprofit involvement that you yeah. got involved with? That's yeah. So right around when everything was changing in my life, that's when I started asking the Lord, mm. you know, show me got what me. I need to do. I, I want to live my purpose out. And um, that's when I became involved with other nonprofit organizations okay. that, again, no idea what the life of a single mom looked like, Grant. I really was clueless. And when I started asking God, you know, show me mm. what I can do, who do I need to serve? I knew that parenting was like something that I definitely wanted to be part of. Right. And uh, I started getting involved with other nonprofit organizations that really taught me what those challenges that single moms face mm. every day, um, why it's so important for all of us to to understand it and know uh, what they are, the, the weight that they're carrying on a daily basis. Tell us about some of those challenges. What so moms it's face? pretty incredible. They they are left with having to carry everything, and it gave me such a great appreciation, Brand, because again, I'm married. We had all of our finances. Um, we have family support. We have the education side. You found a church. Husband. Yeah, we have a church. <laughs> we have everything, right? 
So when Ashton was born, we thought that, okay, I'm an organizer, I'm a planner. So everything is, you know, the way it needs to be. And even my mom was with us and everything was just turned upside down when he came because there was no amount of being ready that will just build you up enough to really be ready because there's so many things that are thrown your way that you just do not expect. And um, realizing that the single moms, they have no support mm. whatsoever. They have no financial backing. They're truly working paycheck to paycheck. They're just trying to survive daily. They're the ones that are making all of the decisions by themselves. There is so much weight on that, that you cannot actually go to your partner and, and try to figure out things together. What's the average age of, of a single mom here in South Florida? Well, so I, honestly, it's really across the board. It's yeah. across the board. Um, but many of them, it happens young. It happens. Well. A lot Maybe of them happen young. But however, there's, yes, but there's a lot of moms that they are, they get married and then they, they become, become divorced. Mom. And right. that's really difficult because when yeah. you're going from a dual income right. to a single income family, it's even worse for them. And that's why they need even more support. Right. But I will say that a lot of my story and the reason why the Lord brought me here, Brandt, was truly because of my own testimony of abortion that mm. I had when mm. I was 19 years old. Mm. Again, I didn't know God as I know him now. And the Lord now has me in a place of where I am, I'm healed, but it's also a platform that I need to share with many. And this is not just a woman thing, but it's an all of us thing for men as well, that they have made that decision, but there's healing that needs to take place. Yeah. And that is so important. And then realizing that again, I didn't make that courageous choice of life. Despite my own circumstances, I still did not have enough courage to be able to do it. Again, I was with my boyfriend, now husband, right? I, I would have had that family support, but I chose differently. And when my whole journey with Christ began, the healing that took place was incredible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at that point was when I really realized that I wanted to be part of their voice and support system for single moms because they're being so much more courageous and and braver than I ever mm. ever was. Is education an issue as well? Many of the single moms either haven't completed sometimes even high school, let mm -hmm. alone college. Yes. Regardless of maybe of what age there are, is that? It is. It is because what happens is about two percent of single moms will completely drop out. Wow. And they will actually two percent will will finish. Will finish. College. Yeah. Right. Well, 2% will finish college, uh, but they they drop out otherwise because they're in full-time mode of working and just being able to provide for the basic needs yeah. of their children. Um, so that's one of the biggest things, and we'll talk a little bit more about yeah. that, of yeah. why it is so important that we make such a big push towards education for, for the single moms that we serve. So it sounds like you were kind of going through a research phase, yes. figuring out what your next step was going to be, asking yes. a lot of guidance from the Lord in yeah. terms of where you're going. When did Hearts for Moms kind of come to fruition for you? What? How many years ago was it? Was there a defining event? Mm -hmm. Was there prayer that was answered? Tell us a little bit about coming so, to that determination. I've been serving single moms for already over 13 years. Wow. So it's been that long. And I'm like, wow, I, I can't believe that it's been So it started that long, long before the nonprofit was even established. Exactly. Because again, I was serving at different capacities through other nonprofit organizations, which really helped me understand yeah. what supports, you know, what the supportive services needed to be. The one thing that I was determined along with the board, Brent, was that this was not going to be a Band-Aid solution. Mm. It needed to be a comprehensive and holistic solution that we will bring to the table. Because again, one supportive services, one supportive service does not work without the other. So what we realize is that what good it is to provide for childcare, which childcare is very expensive, about $250 a week wow. average per child that a mom cannot afford. Mm. So what good is for us to be able to subsidize or cover the cost of childcare if they are facing homelessness, if they're about to be evicted from 
their their rental and what good is having a car again if if they're they're just all across the board on crisis yeah. and not having a car the lack of not having public transportation here in our county is terrible hmm. it's not like you can just go ahead and and flag a bus and go you know like new york i mean they have an incredible public um system transportation system but we don't we lack that right. so on average what i noticed is that the moms were spending anywhere between three to four hours on a bus just or commuting going, to their work yeah, or wow. just going from one bus station to the next hmm. so we knew that we also needed to bring a solution for transportation um we also needed to bring a, a solution for education and establish some scholarship funds because again the moms if they're not onto the path of growth then we're doing nothing and they will be forever stuck on that welfare pit right. that continues to hold them prey. And that that's not what we want. We want to make sure that we are going to allow, you know, bring that support system, that team that is needed, the resources that is needed for in order for a mom to be able to thrive. So um, that's why being able to say, OK, you you need to go onto the path of education whether it's college vocational training or certification or possibly entrepreneurship we are right now uh wanting to start creating a program for the future single mom entrepreneurs wow. that we're having I, i'm literally working with one right now brand and it is so exciting to see because we've seen the potential we see the gifts that this young mom has and we're like, wait a minute, let's start with a side hustle. Let's start thinking about You're adding a stage. Absolutely. Let's think about multiple streams of income. Yeah. yeah. And and it's so important because, yes, we OK, keep the job that you have right now, because it's definitely giving you the, the insurance coverage that you need is not enough. So we do need to create some kind of side hustle. Let's think. Let's start talking about you know, creating, starting your own business. Right. And right. now we are in, in the works of trying to get entrepreneur, entrepreneurship coaches, entrepreneur coaches that will come alongside of the moms and be able to guide them through that process as well. So, so education is a huge push for us. That is, it's a must in order for them to continue to be I, part of the program. I, I love it. Uh, you know, and just to summarize, it sounds like, you know, you, you did those research and kind of realize it's a multifaceted issue. Yes. And, you know, the old adage, you can, you know, feed a man a fish and he eats for one meal. You teach him how to fish and he can eat for the rest of his life. Exactly. You're really providing all of these various issues, which helps them really kind of change their economic status. Absolutely. But also provides that type of internal uh, faith in themselves, mm -hmm. hopefully eventually faith in God. Absolutely. But, but more importantly, you know, that self-confidence really to, to go in and move forward. So, so let's fast forward. So, so uh, Hearts for Moms was founded in what year? So it was 2017. 2017. Yeah. So what was kind of the inspiration? You, you did all this work, you were working obviously with these various learning, all these mm -hmm. things. You just finally say, look, I need to dedicate myself full time to this. You know, Austin's already a teenager. He's mm -hmm. off, you know, doing his stuff after school. Mm -hmm. And walk us through that process of founding. Arts yeah. So again, because I was working with other nonprofit organizations, I was serving um, at many capacities. To be honest with you, I was I was all in full time. I didn't care what I needed to. How do. many nonprofits were you working with? A couple of them. It was two of them. Yeah. And so I realized that again, the bandit approach was not going to be what we wanted, and that's why starting this nonprofit organization seven years ago, it, it helped us build the foundation to what we needed it to be. Um, we had started with another nonprofit that we were licensed through, but again, there was a shift going on because we needed to even serve older single moms. We were focused on serving the younger uh, moms. And when COVID hit, that's when we had to really just kind of pivot because the, the need was so vast and the lord was pushing us he's like we need to serve older moms and we're like haha lord this is funny because everything is shutting down events are shutting down you know we're a nonprofit. we we depend on donations right. especially from the events and um when that's how we were we were pushed to really serve a much bigger population up to 40 years old right now wow. uh but all this pieces were important because it it is what it became today with hearts for moms for us to be able to have the flexibility to 
make it our own according to the needs of the community was imperative. And that's why, again, we couldn't just attend to some of the needs. We needed to attend to all of their needs because we want them to lead the abundant life that God has mm. for them. Amen. Friends. And that's not just for the single moms, but again, it's a trickle effect onto their children yeah. as well. We need to help them break those cycles that are so important so that they can, too, realize their own dreams. You know, Christine and I had the joy of attending your annual soiree. Yes. And I have to tell you, I've never cried so often at a table at a charity event. Was it Sebastian, the young boy? Oh my goodness. Got up. One of the boys who's grown up in the pro got up and sang this wonderful song. to was, mom. I'm choking up just thinking about it now. And then I got the opportunity to speak to them afterwards. And wow, what an amazing, amazing impact. Just my microcosm of seeing one family and all the wonderful things you're doing. Tell us, how many folks do you serve now in South Florida? So right now we have, again, it is a long-term commitment. I want to emphasize that, brand that we're going to break cycles and we're going to, for the moms to really personally. It's not a handout. No, and for them to really personally grow and develop, it's going to take time. So on average, it's anywhere between five to six years that we will have the families. Again, as long as they commit, connect, and change, we're all in. We're walking the journey with them. But it is important that it takes time. If anyone has a formula for us to make it in a short period of time, I'm all in. And every mom is different, right? So she can be at a different stage of her education or possibly even her mental health, because that's one of the services that we provide is mental health counseling. Um, So it depends on the stages where she's at. So, you know, she could be with us for a long period of time. Um, But that's why it's so important that we continue to do and right now we're serving 23 of um, the families and 33 children. Yeah. And we are planning to expand the program because we are facing a crisis right now, France. So for uh, 2024, our plan and our vision is to be able to start the Giving Hope program, which this is a, a one year term, but it's going to allow us to start bringing in the families that are currently on the wait list. And this is mm. really heartbreaking, Brand. How big is the wait list? It's almost 300 oh my families. Gosh. 15 times the number that are in. It is crazy. And that's just, the, we're, this is just Palm it's Beach just County. Here. Just We do have some of the families that they are finding us by, again, however that is happening, either through social media or um, our website, they're finding us some out of state and out of the county, but the majority of them are here in our own backyard. So the the urgency to do something more is really present. Mm-hmm. And and we were we just got tired of talking about the problem brand. We needed a solution. And over the summer, the Lord has been just in total full download <laughs> so that we will pivot and the Changing Lives program that is a five to six year program um, we will shorten the term, make it a little simpler, simpler, but truly be able to stabilize the families that are in crisis. Right. And how we do that is through subsidizing the cost of housing. Uh, if we are able to keep the families where they're at and keep them together and for them to avoid eviction and eventually homelessness, that is the fastest solution that we can ever offer or anybody truly can ever offer because we cannot build fast enough Low income housing, not affordable housing, because forgive me, but affordable housing is truly not affordable. <laughs> not for in our this moms. county. No, <laughs> the cost of housing in here is ridiculous. So that's why we're now going to be adding 10 more moms. So we will be serving 33 um, more families awesome. and growing that number um, for the year. Tell us about your team. How many? employees slash volunteers or on yeah. the for mom squad so we have five um full-time employees and then we have a couple of volunteers as well two volunteers that are full-time and they're doing an incredible job as well and then we have a myriad of mentors because we have christian mentors that come alongside of the families financial coaches because we assign a, finan- a financial coach and these are people that are volunteering, they're volunteering. their time yeah. to help these they're moms. giving their time and yeah. then we also have leaders of the community that come and they also um, lead our skill development classes. We want to give the moms as much knowledge yeah. as possible. They yeah. don't know what they don't know. Right. So it is our responsibility. And mental health professionals as well. Absolutely. You mentioned that donate their time. 
Well, yeah. some of them do donate their time, yeah. but most of the time we are carrying the cost. Contribute to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. it is important. That was the one thing that we were missing, that the one service that we were not giving to the moms right. for a few years. And then we realized that the mom is going forward. She's doing incredible. And all of a sudden she's shooting right back. Yeah. And we're like, what happened? Right. What happened is that she's going back to her normal brand. Routine. She is going, the, the trauma and any triggers will set her back. And, and that's why we had to shift that. And we had to provide that service for Excellent. them. Excellent. What do you look for when you're looking to bring new people into the organization, whether they're volunteers or their employees? Well, for them to be in the same culture, our Christian culture hmm. is number one. Um, you know, I, having someone that is really Christ center, a team that is Christ center, we know how important it is. This is, we say often, God is our CEO brand. <laughs> I actually have that sign above my door because it is a constant reminder that this is his ministry and therefore his culture, his values have to be every day. It have to be lived on. We have to breathe it. It has to be part of it. Being in prayer, being able to speak truth in the, in the lives of the moms is very important. Even some of the curriculum, actually all of our curriculum that we offer, but part of what we um, just partner with through Single Mom University is all Christ Center because his word is just transformational. Yeah. So I need to make sure that our team is in sync with God's values yeah. as well. Do you do quite a bit of in-depth interviewing then? How do you kind of get at that? How do you determine well, the right folks for your team? Being that we're fairly new, I, I will tell you, um, interviewing, that's a, you know, hiring people is a very <laughs> It's art and science. Oh, my It's word. art and science. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning through it. Yeah. But I think I love what one of your uh, guests, I believe it was Vince, that ended up saying that it's easier to be able to teach the skills. Uh, but you know, to really have that person that you see their heart yeah. and their personality just really blends with your culture and your values. You know, that's what I look for first. Yeah. And of course, we want those skills to come, you know, right alongside. But I think I think that really being able to see who they are and um, how they live life it's really at the top of our priority when, when we hire. I was talking to someone earlier today at, at our men's Christian ah, breakfast, which yes. happens today. And tomorrow, of course, Thursday, we're recording this on a Wednesday, is the women's breakfast where, of course, we right. met and we're introduced to Christine. Yeah. But I was saying that, you know, the perfect employee is really finding that intersection between passion mm. and what God's gift is to them. Yes. I think we're all given some gift. Yeah. God does not want us to fail economically. Agreed. God does not want us to live in poverty. Agreed. But to be able to really kind of understand where those gifts are and then match that up with, you know, at least an ounce of passion. To Absolutely. And passion. I mean, that's the part that yeah. really is, is the vein of everything that we do. Yeah. Love the work that you're doing. Angela, we always have one last question we ask. Mm -hmm. we're, we're almost out of time. This okay. has gone so fast. <laughs> but we always ask our entrepreneurs, particularly those that have founded companies and nonprofits, you know, what kind of advice would you give to someone maybe who maybe is in their 20s or in right. their early 30s and thinking about the future and whether it's a career decision or maybe in your case, founding a nonprofit, what, what would you tell them? What's what's kind of the best advice in order to make them the most successful and establish their own organization? Yeah, well, I think, um, again, by the grace of God, he's built me up to be the leader that I've been, I've been coming and I, and I continue to grow. And I think that is the biggest part is just continue to grow, um, reading, learning. Um, Brooke Thomas, uh, which is also a great coach, she says, if you're not growing, then you're dying. And um, one of the things that I love to do is that I love to give books out mm. because they speak to me so much um, and, and you learn so much from it. I mean, I, I'm a fan of Dr. John Maxwell. Um, I read so many of his books. I really try to implement a lot of his teachings, uh, but also surrounding yourself with very wise men and women. Mm. It is so important because you don't know it all. And this girl needs all the help that she can get. Again, this is something that has been a big position that has been given to me. But what I don't lack is the love and the passion. And that has been um, huge driving factors 
to continue to do and stay the course because the need is so grand, but I cannot do this alone. I need to surround myself with a lot of wise counseling. Mm -hmm. And and the Lord, um, he's been blessing me, Brandt, and he actually recently, he said that he's sending me destiny helpers. And that is such a powerful word. And it is happening, 2024 is just, like it's going to be such an incredible year, but he's already given me so many people that want to come alongside and pour into me. So that would be a piece of advice that you got to be open. Yeah. You got to be open to those that the Lord bring to you. You also have to be discerning, right? You need to make sure that they, again, they are of God, um, that this is truly who you need to be able to pair up with and do life with and learn from. But, um, do not stop growing, continue to read, continue to be coached and mentor, mentored. And that's one of the pieces of advice. That's why it's so important when we see a mom and we, we recognize her gifts and talents, how are we going to be able to hone into it? What kind of assessments even are we able to facilitate for her to have so that she can continue to be on that path of, of you know, to grow? So you're doing God's work, Angela. Amen. It's all his. Angela Ball, <laughs> founder and CEO of Hearts for Moms, yes. uh, serving single women, single mothers and yeah. their families here in South Florida. Thank you so very much for sharing your journey into Thank the corner you. office. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.